That's almost 52 years so far. The world has become a worse and worse place. Every year we have... Welcome to Nature Bats Last on the Progressive Radio Network. It's NBL on PRN.FM. This April 2nd, 2019 edition, episode 125 of Nature Bats Last, comes to you from Westchester County, New York, in the United States. This is Guy McPherson, and and I'm joined today by my partner and sometime co-host, Pauline Schneider. Today's show is a tribute to Michael C. Rupert, who died on April 13th of 2014, about five years ago, at the age of 63 years. Wikipedia provides an overview of Rupert's abbreviated life, and a more in-depth analysis is provided by Cherie Speaks in her online book linked at the Wikipedia website. We are not broadcasting live today. The show was recorded in bits and pieces during the last six weeks. We contacted eight individuals who knew Michael well. All eight of them indicated they would love to pay homage to a man very important to them. Seven of the eight followed through, thanks in part to my constant badgering. And while seven out of eight certainly isn't bad, let this be a lesson to those of us who believe we will be remembered favorably by our friends long after we exit this mortal coil. (laughs) Thank you, Guy. Before we start, I want to share my condolences with the families of the victims in New Zealand of the horrific attack on a mosque and its peaceful members. We may never know the full truth of that story, just as we will never know the full truth of 9-11 and the monsters who continue to use our fear against us, which is the reason this radio show exists and was inspired by one of the great truth seekers, Michael Rupert. And today we have a series of testimonials from people familiar with Michael's work. We will start with our own perspectives on how Michael Rupert influenced each of us. And I'll start mostly because mine is very brief. I never met Michael Rupert, um, but I discovered him watching cable one day. It was the Truth Network, and uh, Collapse was on, and it blew my mind. And I could tell this man was telling the truth in that video um, all those years ago. And I just realized that there's so much out there that we're not being told. And we just, we need to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts. Really. Michael was kind to me. He interviewed me several times for his radio show on this station, the Lifeboat Hour. We also corresponded regularly, and he was always supportive. One of the many reasons I miss Michael is his willingness to take extraordinary measures in defense of evidence. I have no doubt that, for example, he would have acted with extreme prejudice toward the many people who have lied about me during the last few years. Indeed, he might have taken a flamethrower to some of these former friends who continue to lie about me. I realize this is a selfish reason to miss Michael. I miss him still. The morning after Michael's death, I was scheduled to visit the PRN studio for a couple of interviews. The PRN producer met me and offered to let me begin hosting the Lifeboat Hour as soon as the following week. A few minutes later, as I was still pondering the idea, the offer was withdrawn. By then, Carolyn Baker had already claimed ownership of the show, to which she gave the Thelma and Louise treatment in less than two years with the Progressive Radio Network. After my trip back to the Mud Hut, I visited a few friends and decided to launch this show, Nature Bats Last. 
I end today with a tidbit recorded shortly after Rupert's death. To begin a presentation in New York on April 17th, 2014, I read a poem sent to me by Michael. It is self-explanatory. Michael C. Rupert, Tracker of Truth, died right after his radio show Sunday night. And with a few minutes before he died, he sent me an email message, along with about a dozen of his other friends. And I'm going to read the poem he wrote that comprised the entire email message. I pray to Mother Earth and Father Sky. I pray to the four winds and ask them to carry my prayer and the sounds of my heart to all things and all places. I pray to the two-leggeds, the four-leggeds, the things that crawl, the things that fly, the things that swim. I pray to all things that grow in Mother Earth. I pray to the stone people. I pray to the little people. I offer tobacco. I offer my flesh. I offer my life. I pray, I pray to all things seen and unseen, known and unknown, for we are all one. This is my final offering. I do it for the children so that they might live. There is no more time. May my offering release love and light into this darkness. Light a fire for me. Pray for me. The sun will rise. The sun will rise. Although we never met in person, Mike Rupert was a friend of mine. We corresponded regularly, and I was I had the privilege to be on his radio show several times. He called me Saturday uh, before he died on Sunday, uh, just to see how I was doing and to tell me he loved me and respected my work. I'm going to talk about kindness today. And I'd be hard-pressed to find a better model than Michael Ripper. We will begin the quest, the guest testimonials with my friend and neighbor, our friend and neighbor, Cameron Kelly, who lives um, just a couple blocks away. Cameron introduced me to Guy uh, several years back when she hosted him in Mount Kisco at the Mount Kisco Public Library in May of 2013. And by that time... Cameron was an avid follower of Michael's work for several years, and here's what Cameron had to say about Michael just a few weeks ago. How do you even begin to talk about the impact of someone that was so profound, so overwhelming, so important to your life for so many years, someone who saved your sanity? Long before Michael C. Rupert began to talk about lifeboats, he was my lifeline. Before he used the phrase tracker of truth to define himself, he was my tracker of truth. I didn't work with Michael, nor did we ever have the opportunity to become friends. I was just one of the many thousands of people so greatly influenced by his work over the course of 13 years of my life. I found Michael's work shortly after 9-11. I grew up in the 60s and 70s, so as an activist, I had no rose-colored glasses on about the depths of U.S. government depravity. I had been arrested protesting against U.S. involvement in apartheid. I worked for disappeared persons in Chile after the U.S. government engineered a coup there, assassinating Salvador Allende, their democratically elected socialist president, and installing Augusto Pinochet, a ruthless murdering dictator. I knew how our government essentially wiped out the Black Panther Party through murdering its young leaders. But 9-11 was an entirely new level of evil. I knew right away we were not being told the truth. I had just been in Las Vegas on New Year's Eve and saw the Hacienda Hotel imploded. The Twin Towers collapsing looked identical to that implosion as they fell in seconds into their own footprints. Thank God I found from the wilderness soon after. And then I saw Michael speak at a conference in New York City. His timeline about 9-11 events, Lucy, you got a lot of explaining to do, was brilliant. It was constantly updated and tied a lot of pieces together for me. From the wilderness was my sanity when many other people I knew and political groups I was involved with refused to look for the truth. 9-11 was a sacred cow that most feared to touch. Even well-educated thinking people that I knew and respected. I read Michael's book, Crossing the Rubicon, more than once. 
understanding more each time. It was my foundation for everything that was happening. 9-11 Truth continues to this day to be my litmus test when I speak with people. Even with architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, so many well-researched books written by respected authors, and so much that has been discovered, many people proudly march on living with the official lie. Mike Rupert gave me this sanity. Over the years with his radio program, The Lifeboat Hour, which I never missed, Michael introduced us to peak oil and collapse, but also encouraged self-sufficiency, permaculture, community, and spirituality. Michael was always one step ahead, and he brought us all along with him on his journey. He was unwavering in his research and had no economic or political axe to grind, so he could always find the truth. He is still being proven right, as now we see Venezuela directly in the U.S. crosshairs, just as he predicted. With John Bolton saying just this weekend that American corporations should have access to Venezuelan oil since it's right in our backyard. The arrogance of American empire no longer even making a pretense of bringing democracy to Venezuela. Could Michael Rupert have been any more right on? Michael Rupert died on April 13th, my birthday. I listened to his last broadcast of the Lifeboat Hour with no idea that it would be his last. He had said over the years that he was seeing people awaken. He said that we must evolve or perish. He spoke often of Gaia, the living earth, and admonished us not to learn, but to remember what's inside us. I try to evolve. I try to remember. And today I honor the memory of this man, Michael C. Rupert, and thank him for remaining always tracker of truth. Uh, That was really beautiful and, you know, shortened to the point as Cameron usually is. Uh, The guest testimonials now will continue with Jenna Orkin. And again, this clip was recorded several weeks ago, and it certainly speaks for itself. You want to know Mike's greatest contribution? Well, he considered himself to be a map maker. He thought of himself as a modern-day Galileo, and that may sound like hubris, but actually um, I believe it was pretty accurate. And I think his greatest contribution were several concrete things. One was the website, which is now at fromthewilderness.net. It used to be something else, but you have to go to .net. And um, the links down the center may fail, but the ones on the left will still work. Second contribution was his book, Crossing the Rubicon, which is unsurpassed and There's nothing really like it. There's nobody who came up with the same information that he did. So difficult and, you know, um, condensed as the book may be, I had to read it twice. Uh, You you should definitely check it out. If you want a thumbnail sketch of what he did, there's an article called Lucy, You Got a Lot of Splain to Do, That's um, a reference to the I Love Lucy show from his childhood, meaning, Lucy, you've got a lot of explaining to do. Now, that is a compendium of clues leading up to 9-11, and it's massive, and again, um, there's historycommons.org, but this article is extremely important. So what else? He did research that at the time was unduplicated by anybody else into the war games that were taking place on 9-11. There were six that we know of, which diverted planes from the East Coast to northern Canada and Alaska, so they were not available to intercept the hijacked planes. And... uh, Planes that were still on the East Coast were sent off in the wrong direction towards Russia at half speed, etc. Um, when Mike wrote that chapter of Crossing the Rubicon, he was quite scared. He actually started drinking again at that point. He'd been on the wagon for years. Secondly, he wrote about the put options surrounding 9-11, which were 
incredibly out of whack, not in the normal, you know, ups and downs of put options, but highly indicative that something big was going to happen to United and American Airlines. And you could say, well, that just shows the terrorists were taking advantage. But what you must also bear in mind is that the CIA monitors <clears throat> put options in real time. So they were forewarned. Um, the other aspect of his great contribution was that he was not uh, misled by little minutiae that uh, most people are in the mainstream media. If he were around today, he would not be reading people's tweets and the responses to the tweets and who deleted a tweet, which people make a big fuss over. He kept his eye on the ball and... That's why he was such, well, I'm mixing metaphors, but that's what made him so valuable to people, um, including over 30 members of Congress who subscribed to the website. And he promulgated the idea, he um, promoted the notion of relying not on physical evidence in relation to crimes, for example, don't even discuss how the buildings collapse because you will never prove it because that evidence is gone. And um, chain of custody will not allow, would not allow such evidence in a court of law these days. So although that's a very popular argument among what are called truthers, Mike wouldn't touch it. He he stayed stuck with the evidence which is irrefutable, um, which was quoted in mainstream sources and which you can find in that article I mentioned. Lucy, you got a lot of splain to do. So uh, those are his greatest contributions. I would also recommend seeing the movie Collapse, which is a double entendre. It's not only about collapse of the world, but about his own personal collapse, and it's very intricately and uh, well done, uh, directed by Chris Smith. Now, the other question that I was asked was my own personal memories of Mike, and those are the flip side of Mike, and they should not, I mean, the flip side should not be overlooked. He should not be viewed as a hero because you do yourself an injustice with that. You need to take into account the whole person. By the way, speaking of that, I forgot to say that one of his contributions was with respect to what he showed us about energy. And when you discuss technological fixes like the electric car and all the renewable energy sources, he stressed, that you have to look at whether they're scalable and what their energy returned on energy invested ratio is, E-R-O-E-I. And unless you know all those things, you're not going to be able to transition from dependence on fossil fuels. That's important. Well, anyway, um, Mike is a human being. It, so for similar reasons, you should look at the entire person. And he was not by any means the saint or the Christ figure that people would like to portray him as. They say, you know, it's almost as though he died for our sins. Um, he killed himself. The government didn't do it. He did it. Bear that in mind. He wa it was, in the end, his own worst enemy. I remember once watching CNN with him and I, it was a State of the Union address, I think, and Dick Cheney was sitting in behind the president, and Mike couldn't watch it. He couldn't look at Dick Cheney. So he walked out of the room muttering to himself, I understand him too well. And that tells you a lot. The reason he had the insight he did is that he knew he was one of them, but he didn't act on it. He fought it. And... um that was what distinguished him from the, from the bad guys. So what I remember most vividly are his battles with suicidality. I remember when he was in Venezuela, he <clears throat> called me, and I had to talk him out of 
sounds so strange, hanging himself from the shower fixture in his roommate's apartment by his necktie. He said, I asked him if, the, if it would hold his weight, and he said yes. He knew it would, but he didn't want the roommate to find him in the morning. Anyway, he was not ready at that point to kill himself, thank God. And when he was at my house, every day it was an argument uh, to dissuade him from killing himself, and I would focus on the next treat of some kind. And one big one was that he was expecting an inheritance of $200,000 from his stepmother, which did come through. So um, although that didn't always cut it, I could use that quite a bit. You know, well, just see what happens when the money comes through. You might feel better. Let You might have some fun with it. Or um, he would pace the living room, muttering to himself, and look out the window. I lived on the seventh floor. And he looked up and down, and he said to himself, never let them know how or when. And if he went outside to smoke a cigarette, he'd go to the roof, and he would come back down saying, I know how I'm going to do it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I remember when, over New Year's, he decided to institutionalize himself in Bellevue Hospital, because he said he was afraid that if he stayed in my apartment, he would kill himself. And he got dressed very slowly and deliberately, all in black. And then he said, this looks a bit somber, doesn't it? And I said, yes, so he changed. And he said he was afraid he'd kill himself. I had the distinct impression that he was afraid he would kill me, because, as I said, he was no angel. And he hated me, basically. He hated New York. He hated me. He confused me with his mother and would mutter to himself, you're not my mother. I can have an intelligent conversation with you. You're not my mother. I had no difficulty understanding that. Thank you to Jenna Orkin. That certain that clip certainly does speak for itself. Each of us responds differently to the death of a friend or companion. For some people, love comes out as anger. Bear in mind that the opposite of love is not hate, it is indifference. Jenna certainly is not indifferent five years after Michael's death. And now we are going to listen to a clip uh, by Cody Snodgrass. My name is uh, Robert Cody Snodgrass, and um, I was good friends with Mike Rupert. I met him here in Colorado after... uh, He had shut his uh, newsletter down and went down to South America. He'd been poisoned down there. He came back up here, and we run the Star Lodge Healing Center here. And uh, we did a lot of high-level healing work on Mike, uh, spiritual stuff. Uh, He almost died in a hospital uh, down in South America, and so he it kind of pushed him to more of a spiritual thing. And so uh, we did a lot of work with him, and we became good friends, and... uh, you know, then later, um, I, I drove him to his last birthday party, um, and then Mike moved from Colorado here back out to uh, California at Sebastopol, and um, I hadn't talked to him in uh, several months, but on the day Mike committed suicide, um my guardian angel came to me and told me about two or three in that afternoon, you know, to call Mike. And it was a real strong feeling. And I hadn't talked to him in a while. And so I called him and we talked for about 10 or 15 minutes. And, um, he didn't give any indication of, of his, what was going to happen, but we had a real good spiritual talk and we talked about things. And before Mike left here in Colorado, like I said, he stayed here at the house, and we did several spiritual healings of a high-level nature. And I had given him an eagle feather. I'm part Cherokee Indian, and so I'd given him an eagle feather for strength, and he took that with him. And then um, I heard the word later, uh, you know, that he had committed suicide. And uh, his girlfriend at the time, Jesse, called me and told me that, you know, he had a, that Glock 40 pistol, and that he used that, and then he had that in one hand, and the eagle feather I gave him in the other hand, and it made me really sad. And uh, 
that was at night when Mike did that. And later that same night, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, Colorado time here, a.m., um, Mike's spirit came here into this house, and he came up behind me, and he got on me, and I got the wachangi, that's a Lakota word for spirit chills. Um, and he told me a very clear voice. He said, I did it to myself, brother, so don't worry about it, but I've got your back here on the other side. That's exactly what he said. And then, oh, within maybe 20, 30 minutes, his roommate here in uh, around Crestone, Colorado, that where he was staying, Doug Lewis, he called me. And I said, wow, I heard, you know, about Mike, and, you know, his spirit just came here, and, and Doug said, yeah, he came visited me, too. So a lot of people thought Mike, you know, was killed by the CIA or something, uh, or or it was foul play. But, you know, Mike had talked to me at the healing center here many times about his feelings of committing suicide, and we tried to work through those and, and get over all that. So... That's kind of a, a, a brief story, you know, about Mike. We love Mike. He was a truth warrior. Uh, he was a very high-level spiritual being, and and we love him very much. And uh, I'm, I'm sad that that happened. And um, um, that's just a little bit a part of one of the stories, you know. So we love Michael Rupert, and we thank him for his service. Um, Next up is a clip from Doug Lewis. Michael Rupert spent a lot of time in his latter years with Doug Lewis in Colorado. They lived in the same house and made music together. Here's what Doug has to say. Yeah, uh, uh, Doug Lewis is my name. Guy, thanks for having me. Um, uh, I am a friend of Mike Rupert's. The uh, reason why I'm on the show, Mike and I uh, were very good friends, very close friends. Uh, we had a different kind of relationship than uh, most of Mike's relationship being that our relationship was based on creativity, uh, specifically music, with uh, a group we formed called the New White Trash and uh, put out a couple of albums. The first one, uh, Double Wide, was a double album, and then the second one, Age of Authority. Um, Mike and I met uh, back in 2008. <clears throat> we actually have more in common than most people know or could even imagine in that um, – uh, both his father and my father uh, were worked at the Pentagon at the same time. My father was a colonel. Um, Mike grew up with a Q clearance. Um, I also grew up with a Q clearance, strangely enough. I was born um, at uh, Fort Belvoir, uh, and that close to Walter Reed there in Virginia. Mike's, uh, Mike was also, I, I think Mike was born on the East Coast, I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, so we both have a long history sort of, uh, with military, military families moving around, I could I could very much relate to Mike and his uh, upbringing and what he went through. Um, as I said, we met you know on a creative basis, which kind of allowed um, us to have a, 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 a more open uh, relationship in terms of our communication. Um, uh, Mike was uh, Mike was a very willing uh, participant in the music and actually quite a good singer, I felt. Um, and also, you know, a great writer. And Mike had the ability to really tune in and, 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 and listen to what was going on. So th that's as introduction. I, I wanted to speak about two things today. Um, one, I get a lot of questions about from people about uh, what actually happened at the end with Mike back in 2014, uh, 2013, going into 2014. Um, what led up to his his suicide? Do I think it was a suicide? Um, what were some of the contributing factors? Um, that's one thing. And the second thing is where I think Mike would be today uh, in his thinking. Uh, here we are in uh, 2019. Um, so... So I'll, I want to touch on that as well. So in regards to Mike and where he was at and what went down um, there at the uh, end of 2013, 2014, well, uh, Mike was in Colorado uh, with me in 2013 at the end. And, uh, you know, like everything and uh, like so many things, everything, everything tends to happen at once. Um um, you know, and, and a lot was going on at that time. As I recall, I had left Colorado 
in a hurry back in October because my mother um, had had an accident in the Bay Area in San Francisco, and I left to take care of her and left Mike with the house. And he he had considered sort of moving out and moving into Crestone, which was 20 miles away, um, it, which had obviously, you know, some, some life to it. It was being in town, and that was something he had been considering for some time. But because I had left, uh, he, he, he had stayed at the house. Um, being a gentleman. And then I had come back in uh, November and I had t- I said to Mike, look, my mom needs my help. Um, if you need to go, uh, you can go. I'm going to close this house up. And, you know, at that point, it was a question of, well, you know, I'd, I would probably end up losing the property if Mike wasn't there. And he understood that and he decided to stay on. And uh, when I got back, I got back right at Christmas time. Um, you know, Mike and I were chatting and uh, he had I think at that time it made the decision uh, to move into Crestone. Um, and then a flurry of activity happened. Um, a lot of decisions were made by Mike, which were postponed and changed and canceled. And he ended up um, not moving to Crestone, but leaving Colorado uh, mid-February 2014, headed to Sebastopol. Um, and then from then on. But, you know, some of the factors... It's interesting. It's 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 it's, it's dynamic. Um, I I would call upon number one, uh, and, and I don't mean to put this in too much of an esoteric realm, but I I would advise people to look at the stars and what were going on with the stars at that moment and the the alignment of the stars. It was it was quite a heavy heavy weekend, as I recall. And the reason why I mention that is because one of my former tenants in, at Red Cloud is an astrologer. Um, and we had talked about that weekend as it related to Mike and as it related to his chart and things. And, um, you know, another factor was Mike's relationship at the time. He was in a relationship. Well, I, I, I wouldn't say he was in a relationship. I, I would say he wanted to be in a relationship, um, but the relationship was actually skirting him. And I mean no disrespect about the relationship or about any parties or anybody involved, but it, Mike was very confused by the entire situation. Uh, it, you know, and Mike was a, he was a very sensitive guy. I mean, he, he, you know, he'd been hurt. He'd been hurt a lot and he was a sensitive guy and he was sensitive, uh, to the needs of others and also to his needs. Um, but he was, uh, you know, he'd been he'd been bit before when it comes to love and relationships, and and I think his tendency was, uh, you know, to fall head first, um, and, and then uh, you know come up for air when he could, um, um, and I think there a little bit of uh, that was going on. But you know, he was in a relationship with a married woman at the time, and um, a- after Mike had left. Uh, she had visited Mike in uh, Sebastopol on her way up north, I think, to Oregon to see the father of her son. She was traveling with her son, um, uh, Jesse, uh, and her son, River. And I have not seen Jesse uh, since all of that happened. I've been in and out of uh, Colorado and Crestone. But, uh, you know, the, it, it was a difficult situation for Mike because he wasn't sure if he was in a relationship or what that meant or wh- where it was going. And I also, you know, would point out that Colorado was probably had, had, had was wearing on him. The cold was wearing on him. Beautiful in the summer, in the spring, in the fall. But look out, you know, the wintertime it, it, it can, can be really, really, really rough. And you, you can really feel a sense of isolation if you don't know how to take care of yourself and busy yourself. And, you know, unfortunately, one of the one of the factors I, 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 that contributed a little bit to that was that we, Mike, had uh, sort of let me know that he wasn't too particularly keenly interested in making any more music. And I think a lot of that had to do with the relationship he was in at the time and what was going on and, and the, you know, the time that he had or didn't have. Um, but um, I guess, you know, the question of suicide moving on to that, um, do I think he committed suicide? Absolutely. Yes. A hundred percent. Mike had talked about it 
on numerous occasions in Colorado, and I had called him out on it. And as a cancer survivor myself, someone who's been given six months to live on more than one occasion, I, I, you know, I got in his face and I said, Mike, I said, you, you know, we, we can't have this, this kind of thinking, you know, you can't be a victim to whatever it is you are thinking you're a victim of. It's just not going to work. It's not going to work here. And, you know, he got it. And, 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 you know, we, for the time he was there and we were living together in Colorado, it was, you know, it was, it was a good, it was a good thing. I mean, we had our ups and downs, but it was a, creative time and uh you know i miss i miss mike unfortunately i really really miss the guy i think a lot about him and uh and i guess that leads me to sort of where i think he would be now and his thinking one of the interesting things that you know i i shared with mike and mike uh um (laughs) got a chuckle out of it was my involvement or my uh yeah my involvement with the clintons with uh, Clinton's back in the late seventies, early eighties in Arkansas. And when I say my involvement, I use that term very loosely. I was in Fayetteville in the late seventies and the early eighties and around Bill Clinton. And I had expressed to Mike on several occasions, what, uh, what a dog I had thought Bill Clinton was just what I could make out of him. Um, I was there as a guest of a friend of Bill Clinton's, um, I didn't know who Bill Clinton was at the time, had no idea, but, you know, but my impression of him was not good, was one of, you know, I thought this guy's a dog, this guy really is a dog. And, um, you know, when I had shared that with Mike and shared what I knew about, what I know about that period of time, and as it relates to uh, the airport out there, Mina, and um, what was going on in Mike's world, the connections were, were sort of, uh, uh, you know, they were too, too, too good to not notice. Um, but, uh, in terms of where Mike would, would be now in his thinking, I, I, you know, Mike, Mike had moved on his, his, he had one foot out of sort of mainstream news or the news of the day and another foot sort of into the, um, you know, overall well-being of the planet. Um, the environment and the causes, but I, I think his I, I think his move to that was out of frustration. Uh, a lot of it, I just don't think he was getting the traction he was expecting in terms of uh, making and breaking the news. I do think I, I I would hope that that if Mike were around today, he he would be aligned. Um, I, I think him and I would be very much aligned. I I am. Uh, uh, I am. Uh, I, I was a Bernie bro until I started to get a real bad taste in my mouth and a real bad smell in the air about what was going on with the DNC and Hillary and the theft from Bernie. And at that time, I discovered George Webb um, truth leaks uh, online and began to follow George and his research and his approach and. I feel that Mike uh, would be very much attuned with uh, George. George is very much attuned with Mike. He's given Mike several shout outs um, as well as Gary Webb. Um, but, you know, I, 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 in Trump versus Clinton, I think Mike would have probably, uh, y- you know, he was no friend of the Clintons. He had no aspirations, uh, you know, to them for their well-being he did not think well of them um and i think that hopefully he would have discovered and seen the light uh that's exposed when one does dig deep for the truth and exposes the data the, the the facts based on the data and the metadata as george webb does um jo- watching george webb is like um is like kind of reading howard zinn in real time it's like getting the real history of america as as it's being played out, it's it truly is the most amazing series uh, on on the web, uh, the George George Webb News Citizen Journalist. But I would hope that Mike would would have ha- been revitalized at least by the situation. Um, uh, I don't know where he would be in relationship to Trump and and and, and his thinking. I mean, I just don't want to say I, I I can't, but I. I think Mike was pragmatic enough to 
understand, and he was a realist enough to understand that you can have an opinion, you can have a belief, but it's the facts and the data and the metadata that really prove the point or disprove the point. And at that point, you can believe or not believe, but um, it really is about the data and the metadata and the facts and you know, what is going on now and what's truly been discovered and what's available if one wants to, to dig is, 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 is is frightening, is is really frightening. And I think Mike would have been um, at the forefront of exposing all of this along with the likes of George Webb, um, Lee Stranahan, you know, a lot of the, uh, the independent citizen journalists that are out there now that are being shunned and, shut down by Twitter and Facebook and so on and so forth. Um, So anyway, that's what I'm, that's, that's my O2 on Mike. As I said, uh, miss you, Mike, rest in peace, bro. You're, you're a good man. We had some good times. And if you want to have a listen to the music, it's uh, available on Bandcamp, new white trash. Um, There's also, I think there's a new white trash website. And if you want to read any of my musings about Mike, um, uh, those are available at the blog I occasionally write on the called Venice Arts Club. Um, I think if you Google Venice Arts Club plus Mike Rupert, you'll get a whole bunch of stuff up. And that's it for me. Thanks for listening. My name is Doug Lewis. I live in Moffitt, Colorado beautiful Moffa, Colorado, and uh, expecting a, a warm spring, a lovely summer, and uh, anybody want to come out and hang out, I've got an Airbnb out there. Just Google uh, Red Cloud Ranch, Moffa, Colorado. Book yourself in and come out and have a laugh and sit by the fire where... Well, that was a, so amazing to listen to. Um, so much detail and introspection and just really beautifully said. It's really... It's so interesting to hear all of these different perspectives. Yeah, and, you know, from people who lived with Michael and played music with him or only talked with him on the phone, as is this case with some of the people we're hearing the voices from today. So it's quite a wide range of perspectives and quite a range of emotions that we're hearing today as well. Next up, we're going to hear from Mimi Gurman. Mimi met Mike through Fukushima, and they talked often about nearly everything. They covered a wide range of topics, even though they met only electronically. Mike Rupert was a seer. He saw the veils that society wove, the corporations used to blind the people, the governments used to kill off the people, and he saw the veils of dimensions that most people can't see, the veils into other worlds. It was this that made our friendship strong, although incredibly short-lived. I didn't know Mike before the triple meltdown at Fukushima. At that time, I was busy collecting and recording radiation readings from folks like myself who knew that 311 was another game-changer on Mother Earth for plant life, animal life, and human life for generations to come. Mike had heard about me and was interested. We talked about how the government was committing slow genocide against all life on the planet with its fake green nuclear power energy and how Chernobyl and Fukushima and Hanford and the list went on and on were slowly killing us all due to radiation. After that first show, we became close friends. Sometimes looking back, we were lifelines for each other, as in a breath of fresh air, coming up for moments at a time to inhale a more beautiful reality. Each time I'd call Mike, he'd be listening to Terrence McKenna. He'd answer the phone and say, perfect timing. We talked about everything other than world issues because we were on the same page regarding those. And those were in a way boring to talk about when we had more esoteric things to discuss like magic and the mystery of plant medicines and astral travel. That was my friendship with Mike. I was planning a trip down to see him right before he died. I had wanted to trip with him. I was really looking forward to that. He's tripping now. And by that, I mean in the best way, the most free, free of body, free of constriction, free of whatever might have ailed him. I remember his last week on earth. We talked a lot that week. Later in the week, he asked me to join him on his show. He insisted. 
He told me I must be his guest. It was weird hearing that from him. I told him maybe it was best to give the hour to Carolyn since Mike usually had only one guest on at a time. He said, no, you have to be on the show. You're going to be on the show. After the show, a final email from Mike. I tried to call him after I received the email because the email was so strange. It wasn't a usual Mike email, but he didn't answer his phone. He didn't answer and wouldn't answer to any of us anymore. I wanted Mike as my friend for the rest of my life. Metaphysically speaking, we're still friends. He's out there and me inside this body. We still communicate. I feel blessed that Mike was my friend. He was a guru and teacher to many, but for me, he really was my friend. I still miss him, his voice, his laughter, his stories, his excitement, listening to his troubles as he shared those with me. Mostly, I just wanted to hang out with him, to see him and explore that outer and inner realms of life with him. I know he's all right. It is we who are not. Love you, Mike. As with me, Mimi never met Mike in person. As with me, she worked with him online and on the air. As with me, she views Mike as a friend that, tragically, she never had the opportunity to meet. And we're going to now listen to Jack Martin, who, whose property Mike lived on. Michael died on Jack Martin's property near Sebastopol, California. So, if we could hear now from Jack Martin, that would be great. Okay. Hi, my name is Jack Martin. I had the uh, wonderful opportunity to be a personal friend of Mike Rupert's. Mike's been gone for a while now, but the impact that he had on our lives is still very much with us. He was a man on a mission, and that mission was to make sure that for many of us who uh, didn't completely buy the official version of what was going on in the world had an opportunity to get a look behind the curtain. Michael certainly was very adept at uh, connecting the dots and knowing what was going on behind the curtain. From his early days as a detective in Los Angeles, his work to expose the real truth about the drug trade, he that led him to look for uh, the truth behind the forces and events that shape all of our lives, things that aren't really readily apparent to most of us and certainly not reported in the mainstream media. He had a long history of uh, alternative journalism, and his followers knew that he could be counted on for insight and diligence. He, he was a really great journalist, and his attention to detail was just superb. His, uh, his work didn't make many assumptions. He just reported the facts. And that's what made his book, Crossing the Rubicon, uh, such a prominent example of his investigative expertise. That seeing that and being able to read that book really changed my life and opened my eyes to the notion that uh, many of the things that I suspected were going on in the world that I didn't understand really were happening. You know, whether you believed everything in that book or not, there was enough meat in there to make anyone realize that the official account of the events of 9-11 just didn't hold up. So as I said, I had an opportunity that not many folks had. I was close to Michael and was able to watch him work. He basically lived with me for the last few months of his life, and I was with him on a daily basis. And so it was easy for me to see the pain and frustration that he had with what was going on in the world. He had a, an odd position in the world. His stature as a journalist prompted people from all over the world to reach out to him to share information that they had discovered about economics, politics, technology, all kinds of things, and usually the... Uh, the less positive aspects of those things. People knew that he was a fearless reporter and felt that they could confide in him with things that they knew. So he was assaulted on a daily basis with ugly truths from all around the planet. By the time he came to stay with me, he was carrying a tremendous weight, knowledge of things that most of us just know nothing about, 
and he had paid dearly for that knowledge throughout his life with persecution and assassination attempts. So uh, I didn't really understand the impact that knowing all this had on his life and his death, which I do believe was by his own hand, was certainly a surprise to me, but it was less surprising to people that had known him better than I had and longer than I had. Uh, I had I recorded a long video, which is still up on YouTube. Jack Martin narrates the death of Michael Rupert, a lovely title there. And I gave the most complete, truthful, and accurate account of everything I knew about Michael Rupert, his work, his life, and the circumstance of his death. So it was easy for me to believe, given how controversial he was, that there were plenty of people who would have gladly seen him silenced. But I do believe in the end that it was his own choice to return to Mother Earth, as Michael put it. So I can't help but take a minute, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak to the many of you who think that I and some of Michael's other friends might have played a part in his death. It's just not so. Uh, you know, what I saw, the, the local law enforcement authorities and the thoroughness of their investigation, I believe that what appeared to have happened really happened. Could there have been a couple of guys that skipped off into the hills after forcing Mike to kill himself? I suppose, but I don't really think so. So I ask that those of you who think those things about us, by dishonoring Michael's friends, you dishonor Michael. Those of us who knew him and had the opportunity to be close to him supported him in every way we could, and we were always in his debt for the clarity that he gave us about the things in the world that he chose to shine a light on. So Michael was a powerful guy. He opened our eyes. He gave voice to... uh, ideas and fears that we couldn't quite put a handle on and he was a wonderfully positive influence to people that were willing to look beyond the official event the the official account of what's going on in the world and i still miss him i know his other friends miss him and i hope that his work continues to inspire people to pursue the truth and that is what I have to say to memorialize Michael five years after his passing. Thanks. I met Jack a few years ago while I was on a speaking tour in the area. We chatted on his property for about an hour. I doubt anybody knew Michael better than Jack Martin in the final weeks of Mike's life. The YouTube clip referenced by Jack provides his own evidence-inspired perspective on Mike's death, and I encourage you to track it down and give it a listen. Along with Jack, I was blamed for Mike's death and the days following his death. We shared that experience, the likes of which nobody wants to share. We're going to listen to uh, Jamie, Dr. Jamie Hecht, who worked very closely with Michael. And um, after a few years in a tenure-track position, Jamie voluntarily left the academy and moved to Southern California to work with Michael. I met Jamie there when Jamie hosted me on tour a few years ago. So I got to know Jamie and his experience and and later interviewed him on this program, Nature Best Last. I think that was the only show I've ever done with somebody that we ran through the music at the end because I was having such a riveting conversation with Jamie Hecht. So we'll hear from Jamie now and his experience with Michael C. Rupert. This is the anniversary of Mike Rupert's death, and I want to talk about his achievements, but I can't do that without first saying that he was a good man and he was a good friend. He had some things he could not work out, uh, as Lenny Bruce uh, was described by Bob Dylan. Uh, In Mike's case, addiction and a severe narcissistic personality disorder, both of which came out of a very dark trauma background that I don't claim to know much about, but I do know that it was there. He was a very difficult person, uh, but he was also a beautiful person inside. He made a mess in a lot of different ways, a lot of different places, but he meant a lot to a lot of people. And his achievements 
Well, there were quite a few. I think the biggest one was that he figured out how 9-11 got pulled off. He was the person who discovered the war games, uh, that there were as many as five simultaneous drills happening that day uh, in the military um, and uh, on the ground in other parts of the government, like uh, at the World Trade Center and so on. There were quite a few different drills going on that matched the emergency itself and drew people and resources and attention away from the actual emergency. That's what neutralized the people who wanted to do their jobs that day and protect the public. Uh, people in the military, people in the FAA, um, people uh, on the ground and in the building at the World Trade Center uh, towers and so on. A lot of people want to do their jobs. A lot of people leading up to the events wanted to do their jobs. The FBI uh, and other federal agencies who are tracking uh, the participants in this uh, in this uh, event and the planning leading up to it, who are silenced, some of them done away with, uh, others marginalized. Some of them uh, not only stayed alive, but wrote books and brought their information to the public, which backs up what Mike uh, was pointing to at the time. He knew those people like Sybil Edmonds and Colleen Rowley, uh, uh, knew them early on. So Mike explained how this was pulled off. Before Mike found the war games, everyone in the 9-11 truth community, uh, for better or worse, uh, thought that it was a stand-down order which had prevented the most powerful air force in the world from protecting its own building and the financial capital of the country. Um, a stand-down doesn't make sense because these pilots train their whole lives to protect the public. An emergency like that happens, uh, they might just go protect the public anyway and escort a hijacked airliner out of the sky or, if necessary, shoot it down before it hits an urban center, which is what happened. Killed thousands of people. Uh, the motivation, of course, was the end of the Bill of Rights, the rise of the Patriot Act, the national security state, uh, endless ticket for war that won't end in our lifetimes. And Mike made sense of all that with a crucial piece that was missing. He had a larger analysis about uh, money as debt conjured into existence for infinite growth on a finite planet, uh, which is impossible and is not only suicide, it's omnicide. It kills everything. And Mike was passionate about this. Many of us are. I know... I know you are Guy McPherson and uh, Derek Jensen, so many people, millions of people uh, wrestling with reality this way every day. And Mike was really, a, you know, he was a jerk, but he was a, he was a leading light. He really had balls and he was all heart. And I miss the son of a bitch and I wish he was still around. Mike Rupert was a great and imperfect man. Most of us share with him the second of these two attributes. His imperfections were used in attempts to destroy him and his message. Perhaps they succeeded, at least in part. I have frequently commented since the night of his death that he pulled the trigger, but he did not load the gun. The harassment he received was monumental and horrible. He remains an inspiration to me as I pursue my own evidence-rich work. And it reminds me so much of Joseph Campbell's The Face of a Thou The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Oh. You know, every hero is is laden with the burden of imperfection, and every hero has an Achilles heel, and all it takes to bring one down is to find their Achilles heel. Thanks so much to our contributors and listeners today, as well as AfroZen for our theme music. You can catch NBL on PRN the first Tuesday afternoon of each month at 3 p.m. Eastern. This means our next episode will broadcast live on Tuesday afternoon, the 7th of May, when Kevin will be back with Guy, and they'll be joined by English climate scientist Jem Bendel. If you miss the broadcast, you can find shows in the archives at prn.fm, the Podbean, or at Stitcher, and feel free to rate us on iTunes. Also, continue to follow the Nature Bet's last blog. GuyMcPherson.com for further updates, interviews, and speaking tours, which are coming up in the following month. Until next time, remember, the dominant culture has been very clever, but in the end, nature bats last. Bad.